This episode is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Hey, listeners, whether you love true crime or comedies, celebrity interviews, news, or even motivational speakers, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue, right? And guess what? Now you can call the shots on your auto insurance. Enter the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. The Name Your Price tool puts you in charge of your auto insurance by working just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance. Then they'll show you a variety of coverages that fit within your budget, giving you options. It's easy to start a quote. You'll be able to choose the best option for you. It's fast. Now that's something you'll want to press play on. It's easy to start a quote, and you'll be able to choose the best option for you. It is just one of many ways you can save with Progressive Insurance. Quote today at Progressive.com to try the Name Your Price tool for yourself and join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. When we made our McDonald's spicy chicken McNuggets, you were praise hands emoji. Then we ran out and you were streaming tears emoji. Now they're back, so you can be grinning face with sweat emoji. Order ahead on the McDonald's app. And get money mouth face emoji with two orders of crispy, irresistible 10-piece McNuggets. Spicy or classic for just $6. Limited time only. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Single item at regular price. It isn't hard to see how unpopular Benjamin Netanyahu's become. The deaths of civilians in Gaza, including international aid workers, has prompted the U.S. to use stronger and stronger language to denounce the war and Israel's prime minister. Even Israeli TV is treating Netanyahu like a punchline. Israeli SNL just did this parody of We Are the World, only it was Netanyahu and his governing coalition singing Without the World railing against former allies and calling their enemies Nazis. <laughs> then there are the protests. Protesters taking to the streets and directing their rage at the people who lead their country. This week, there's been day after day of protests in Tel Aviv, even right in front of Netanyahu's home in Jerusalem. Everything is horrible because this government doesn't want to take care of any of these problems, only of itself. Are a majority of Israelis fed up with Netanyahu and his coalition? They are. They're not necessarily fed up with the war, although that's a complex conversation. But they have been fed up with Netanyahu since October 7th. Yair Rosenberg covers Israel for The Atlantic. October 7th basically destroyed Netanyahu's own argument for himself and his candidacy that he's made uh, for decades, which is that I will keep you safe. Uh, you may not like me. You may think I'm corrupt. You may think I'm many things, uh, but nobody else can be trusted with Israel's security. But Yair says there's a practical problem when it comes to this fed up feeling. Elections aren't scheduled for another year and a half. Netanyahu doesn't want to leave. And the coalition of far-right politicians who banded together to support him as prime minister are holding firm. Because they know that if they break up, they'll have to face the voters and they'll be in a much worse position when elections are over. It's basically, you know, Netanyahu is uniquely unpopular. You know, 70% of Israelis want him to resign after either now or after the war. Um uh, but at the same time, there's no mechanism for forcing him to do it. That has to come from within his own coalition, which has to break apart. So the questions become, is there a way to crack this coalition from the inside? Which, you know, brings us to the controversy within Israel over uh, a sort of seemingly uh, esoteric issue that's actually so essential to Israeli society that it could still break up this coalition that has every incentive not to break up. This esoteric issue Yair is referring to, it isn't exactly about the war in Gaza, but the military response to October 7th has made it much more urgent. This issue is about military service, who's doing it and who isn't. Since Israel's founding, ultra-Orthodox Israelis, known as Haredim, have been allowed to skip serving in the IDF. 
even though service has been mandatory for everybody else. Netanyahu has promised the Haredim that as long as they support him, things will stay the same. But suddenly, this promise has become a wedge. What's unique today is that because of the war, um, the issue of salience has been heightened dramatically. Uh, because imagine your um, sons, your husbands, your daughters are going out uh, to war. They're uh, on the battlefield. Um, and every day uh, you wonder if you're going to get a knock on the door that something has happened to them. Everyone knows somebody who knows somebody. Um, and meanwhile, the ultra-Orthodox, their lives have not really changed since October 7th. They continue to do the exact same things. And so suddenly, what was already a fault line is now an earthquake. It's really split open and people are saying this is not tenable. Today on the show, the domestic debate that may prove more powerful in reshaping Israel than pressure from Washington or protests in the street. I'm Mary Harris. You're listening to What Next. Stick around. This episode is brought to you by Discover. When it comes to your finances, Discover wants you to know they are the credit card that is always there for you. With 24-7 U.S.-based live customer service, everyone has the option to talk to a real person anytime, day or night. Yep, that means no more waiting for, quote, normal business hours just to get a hold of someone. We are talking real service from real people whenever you need it. Get the customer service you deserve with Discover. Limitations apply. See terms at discover.com slash credit card. This episode is brought to you by Wondery. With the launch of ChatGPT, Sam Altman and OpenAI reinvigorated our imaginations and fears of a world with artificial intelligence. While the company looked like a stunning success from the outside, a battle was brewing within on what the future of AI should be. Almost a year after launching ChatGPT, that battle erupted into a war when the company fired its charismatic CEO, Sam Altman. From Wondery, Business Wars is a podcast about the biggest corporate rivalries of all time. In the newest season, host David Brown digs into the philosophical differences within OpenAI that culminated in Sam Altman's shocking firing, the chaos that followed, and what it means for the future of safety of AI in the modern world. Follow Business Wars on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen early and ad-free right now by joining Wondery Plus. And for more deep dive and daily business content, listen on Wondery, the destination for business podcasts. With shows like How I Built This, Business Wars, The Best One Yet, Business Movers, and many more, Wondery means business. One of the fundamental things I feel like I understand about Israel is that everyone serves in the military. So when I learned that that wasn't true, I was surprised. Can you just explain how this exemption for ultra-Orthodox Israelis was created in the first place? Yeah, so Israel was founded in 1948. That came with the creation of the Israel Defense Forces, the Israeli army, which is populated through a mandatory draft. But since basically the founding of the state, that draft has exempted ultra-Orthodox yeshiva students, Haredi students. David Ben-Gurion, Israel's first prime minister, acquiesced to the request of this community to be exempted from the draft because he thought it was a very small price to pay for their political support. They were a tiny community. They were something like 1%, depending on estimates uh, of the population. Um, and the exemption was just for 400 uh, men uh, in religious academies. Uh, but the other thing to understand is that David Ben-Gurion was a secular socialist, uh, and he didn't have much time for religion. Hmm. And so he thought, that these people are yesterday's news. They're kind of backward and they're going to disappear because, you know, the light of reasons and the enlightenment and so forth are going to continue on and they're going to die away. So I make this carve out now and sooner or later, these people won't even be around to be exercising it. Sounds like the opposite has happened. The exact reverse. Uh, like many uh, secular ideologues at the time, he underestimated the resilience uh, of religion and religious feeling. Um, and instead of this community dying away, it became the fastest growing population in Israel um, and now constitutes 13% of the population. I have a kind of basic question. Why don't the Haredi serve? What's Why don't they want to? So there are several reasons. One is simply that they believe in a 
pietistic, cloistered way of living that separates them from all secular influences and uh, is devoted uh, to religious observance and in some cases, religious study. And so they prefer to be left out of the various institutions of the state. Uh, some of them are, they're not anti-Zionist so much as non-Zionist. And so they see drafting people into a secular army where they're going to have to mix with all sorts of people from all sorts of backgrounds uh, and ideologies that they disagree with to be a threat to their way of life. Huh. And they may not say this uh, so publicly, but of course they're worried, the, the leaders of the community are probably worried that if you expose uh, members of their community to uh, alternative ways of living, some of them may decide that those are better um, and you lose uh, some of your community. That's of course already happening in Israel just by dint of living in a modern society and having access to uh, the, you know, things like the internet, but they manage actually to keep the community pretty cloistered. They often use things like phones that don't access the internet. It's not just because they're part of some crunchy community that doesn't want their kids using social media or something, um, but because they want to you know, keep out um, outside influences. Can you explain how this system of military exemptions works? Because it's evolved, is my understanding. So it's no longer just about exemption from the military. It's also about this system of government funding for religious academies, yeshivas. Exactly. So when you don't get drafted into the army uh, in Israel, the way you get out of it is by attending a yeshiva saying, I am engaged in religious study. That, it, that was the original whole point of the exemption. How long do you have to attend a yeshiva? For as many years as your army eligibility goes. Huh. Right. And that that age is, uh, is you know, is changing actually now because they're expanding army eligibility because of the manpower shortage in the IDF, given the conflicts that Israel confronts. Um, and so you have many years, you know, of which are prime age, sort of like college years, which normally Israelis spend in the military and then they go to university. And instead, during that time period, um, ultra Orthodox Jews are in religious academies. Um, so not only are they uh, not serving in the army, but they're not serving in the economy and they're not getting uh, a secular education, which makes it very hard for them then to integrate into the broader Israeli economy. Um, which creates a totally separate problem for Israel, which is an economic time bomb where the fastest growing population uh, in the country, the men don't work. At all? At all or in very small ways. And so they persist on government welfare, uh, which funds their religious institutions and also funds just the families who need it. Um, and that is what the ultra-Orthodox political parties basically exist to preserve, this system, right? So they've they've been in the Tengau's coalition for years. Um and this is their core issue. You fund our institutions and you keep the army exemption going, and we'll basically rubber stamp everything else you want to do. I can see how this would create tremendous resentment. Like, when did Israelis, other Israelis, first start taking issue with this military exemption? So it goes back decades. And already back in, uh, I think it's uh, 1998, 1999, uh, the Israeli Supreme Court ruled that the ultra Orthodox um, exemption from military service violated equality under the law. And they ordered the Israeli government to come up with a more equitable solution. And since then, there's been a lot of can kicking. There's been a lot of uh, attempted reforms that then the Supreme Court says these are not serious and sends them back. And so we're still uh, in the same system, but the Supreme Court is, you know, sort of running out of patience. It's striking to me how long the debate over military exemptions has been going on. I mean, you just talked about how Israel's Supreme Court ruled in 1998 that the exemption was unconstitutional. There was another ruling in 2017. Why do you think this moment right now is different? So as in all things in politics, it's a matter of priorities. If you ask voters in the United States, what do you care about? They'll give you a whole list of issues, but they'll tell you things like the economy or immigration matter the most to them. And other things are way down on the list. And so politicians can win or lose on those issues while being out of step on the lower rung issues. And for a while, as much as people resented the ultra-Orthodox exemption, they deprioritized it because they felt, you know, this is a price that we pay to get many other policies on the economy, on national security and other things. The ultra-Orthodox parties vote with, you know, the way I want on those things. And uh, I will, you know, grit my teeth and move along, um, you know, sort of paying them off uh, for that. Now it is the priority because it ties into everything that's going on, right? Israel's fighting a multi-front war with Hamas uh, in the South and Hezbollah in the North. It needs manpower more than anything else. Um, and that's making it extremely difficult for Netanyahu to, you know, sort of navigate the tensions in his own coalition, which consists of secular right wingers and also religious right wingers and also ultra orthodox. Yeah, how big of a role do the ultra orthodox play in Netanyahu's coalition? 
He has 64 seats out of Israel's 120 in the Israeli parliament. And of those 64 seats that Netanyahu has, 14 of them come from the far right, but 18 of them come from the ultra-Orthodox. Hmm. So they're actually even more powerful. Yes. And not only that, they've been much more longstanding partners to Netanyahu. The, ultra, the, the far right parties are relatively new, um, and Netanyahu helped them come into being and used them to shore himself up. But the ultra-Orthodox have been in government after government after government for Netanyahu. He basically promised them everything they wanted, and they stuck with him. And he needs to keep them if he wants to keep the coalition together and have a political future. After the break, if Netanyahu can't deliver on this one promise to his supporters, is it just a matter of time before the coalition falls apart? This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now, getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy, and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $750 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. This episode is brought to you by Discover. When it comes to your finances, Discover wants you to know they are the credit card that is always there for you. With 24-7 U.S.-based live customer service, everyone has the option to talk to a real person anytime, day or night. Yep, that means no more waiting for, quote, normal business hours just to get a hold of someone. We are talking real service from real people whenever you need it. Get the customer service you deserve with Discover. Limitations apply. See terms at discover.com slash credit card. After October 7th, how did you begin to see the cracks forming in the coalition and then just in the wider Israeli public? Yeah, so to understand the cracks, you need to understand the different players here. There are many varieties of religious Jews uh, in Israel. There's also the religious Zionist community, um, which is more modern and integrated into the economy and the military. They tended to, you know, not engage in the debates and sort of have, you know, some respect uh, for the the exemption, even if they disagreed with it. Um, but now, with the, that community is at, is is fighting the war like everybody else, they feel particularly aggrieved that the you know their fellow religionists are not in, are not involved. Um, and so you're starting to see things like grassroots, uh, you know, uh, initiatives and open letters, like an open letter written by a mother uh, of so of a soldier saying, you know, none of our children were cut out or raised to, uh, you know, risk their lives and you know potentially die in a war. Uh, but it's what you have to do sometimes uh, if you live in a society um, that needs to defend itself. Those religious Zionist voters, many of them are right wing, and many of them are represented by politicians in Netanyahu's government. And those politicians are responsive to those constituents. Um, and so you have this problem for Netanyahu, which is that different pieces of his coalition now are sort of at war over this issue. Um, and any sort of bill that he might try to pass uh, to resolve it is probably going to make one side very upset. So at the same time that this rift is forming within Netanyahu's coalition after October 7th, Netanyahu is also working with this April 1st deadline to come up with some kind of legislation addressing the military exemption issue. April 1st was Monday, and to my knowledge, nothing happened. Can you explain what this deadline was and, and where we are now? When the Israeli Supreme Court ruled you know, decades ago that this uh, exemption for the ultra-Orthodox violated equality under the law, uh, it said the government needs to come up with a different solution. And the governments keep trying to do that, and the court keeps throwing it back at them and saying these are not serious. And so Israeli governments are asked by the court to give us a new proposal, and they get deadlines. And this government, well before October 7th, um, set a deadline of 
uh, March 31st uh, to come up with the next proposal uh, to fix this issue. Now, nobody expected that proposal to actually fix the issue, but because of the war raising the salience of this issue and making it really hard for Netanyahu's coalition to agree, Netanyahu's government did not meet the deadline and did not come up with a bill. And by not giving the Supreme Court any sort of bill, um, that kicked in um, the penalties that the Supreme Court said, which is that, okay, fine, the exemption has to just stop working. The Supreme Court in Israel did give Netanyahu 30 more days to try to come up with a bill, with a, a draft solution. Um, so they have now a sort of extension, right? Some of the consequences are kicking in for passing a deadline, but the, some of them are sort of in limbo. Um, but 30 days is, you know, Israel's about to celebrate Passover there. It's not a lot of time. Unless Netanyahu can figure out a solution, Israel's ultra-Orthodox may be forced to serve in the IDF. Yair says it wouldn't necessarily mean draft notices are going out right away. The military would have a lot of logistics to figure out. But aside from conscription, this missed deadline has already had some actual consequences, and the politics could get messy. The more consequential thing that's already started to happen is that the court said by you know starting April 1st, if you don't have something for us, um, it's time to stop subsidizing a bunch of these ultra-Orthodox institutions, these yeshivot. And that has begun. Now, Netanyahu has already said, and it's been reported in Israeli media, that he's finding ways you know, to sort of redirect money to the community underneath the table. And he's probably also promised them that once we pass this, we'll make you whole, meaning we'll give you back pay. You know, Netanyahu has to come up with something that can satisfy these seemingly irreconcilable uh, divisions. This issue is just so seismic. It's like the one thing that could still blow up the coalition anyway. And Netanyahu being so hobbled in the polls, it's not like he's this colossus who's, you know, used to bestride Israeli politics, who can sort of basically make people do what he wants. They're like, you are the least popular politician in the country right now. And to be clear, if he loses just five members of his coalition, what would force elections? If he can't pass this bill um, because he loses five members of the coalition, really four, because it's say it ties, then the ultra-Orthodox parties might leave the coalition. They might say, okay, well, we're not getting the one thing that we're in this government for. Um, and so we're going to leave because we have to show that there are consequences for crossing us. This is our single issue. Um, and then if they leave the coalition, they can join the opposition in what is called a no confidence vote uh, in the government. And if the no confidence vote succeeds with a majority of members of parliament, then the government falls and elections happen. Um, so it sort of comes down to what the ultra orthodox parties really want, what their religious leaders say. Um, so if the ultra orthodox think that they have a shot at getting a better deal with a more functional coalition later, uh, they might do it. Um, and so it's really hard to know. Right. These are sort of like very like uh, Game of Thrones like maneuverings within the Israeli parliament. And, you know, Netanyahu is the consummate political survivor. He has gotten out of so many of these sorts of scrapes in the past. The question is, um, is this one different? You made it pretty clear that there are a lot of twists and turns to come before any kind of change in leadership in Israel. But I am curious if this issue somehow did topple Netanyahu and his government. Do you think that would change anything about the war in Gaza? Israelis are behind the broader war effort to eliminate Hamas, right? They see it as an existential threat. But how you do the war um, is a more complicated question. And the opposition parties like Benny Gantz, right, who's in the Israeli war cabinet, these are people who want to get to yes with the Biden administration. And one of the ways they want to do that is to have a different post-war strategy than Netanyahu does. Netanyahu doesn't really seem to have a post-war strategy. Israel conquers a piece of Gaza with its military strategy and then doesn't know what to do with it. Israel isn't putting new people in power. Israel isn't uh, you know, creating uh, places for aid and administration and policing and all of those things. Um, because to do that, they'd have to work with Palestinian partners. And Netanyahu is far-right uh, coalition members don't want to work with Palestinian partners. Um, and not only that, they would like to expel Palestinians and resettle the territory. So if you have people in your coalition whose day after plan for Gaza is we take it, um, you can't really say, no, we're going to work with, say, the Palestinian Authority to govern Gaza properly uh, so that Hamas doesn't come back. Uh, but that's what the Biden administration wants. And it's probably what Benny Gantz wants. And so you would see a very different like approach to what is the purpose of this war um, and what is the end goal. It's not the same as like, oh, these are a bunch of peaceniks who are going to be sitting down and singing Kumbaya. They're not going to do any of that. Um, but they would change uh, how they approach the rest of the war and what the purpose of the war is and, and what the aim for the Palestinians in Gaza is when it's done. 
those I think are actually very significant and they're not discussed, uh, you know, abroad where people have a tendency for different reasons to pretend like if Netanyahu was replaced, the state, nothing would change, right? Netanyahu's own supporters have every incentive to say that because they're like, oh yeah, you criticize him, but if you got rid of him, everyone would just do the same thing. They all know that's not true, right? They know that's not true. That's why they oppose elections. Netanyahu has given multiple speeches arguing that Israel should not go to elections because he knows he'd lose them and he also knows his policies would lose them. Yair, I'm really grateful for your time. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Yair Rosenberg is a staff writer at The Atlantic. He's also the author of its newsletter, Deep Shtetl. After we recorded this interview, Benny Gantz, that member of Israel's war cabinet, he made a statement calling for new elections to take place in just a few months. And that's our show. If you are a fan of what we're doing here at What Next, the best way to support our work is to join Slate Plus. Go on over to slate.com slash whatnextplus and figure out how. What Next is produced by Paige Osborne, Alana Schwartz, Rob Gunther, Anna Phillips, and Madeline Ducharme. We are led by Alicia Montgomery with a little boost from Susan Matthews. Ben Richmond is the Senior Director of Podcast Operations here at Slate. And I'm Mary Harris. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you back here next time. This episode is brought to you by Discover. When it comes to your finances, Discover wants you to know they are the credit card that is always there for you. With 24-7 U.S.-based live customer service, everyone has the option to talk to a real person anytime, day or night. Yep, that means no more waiting for, quote, normal business hours just to get a hold of someone. We are talking real service from real people whenever you need it. Get the customer service you deserve with Discover. Limitations apply. See terms at discover.com slash credit card. When we made our McDonald's spicy chicken McNuggets, you were praise hands emoji. Then we ran out and you were streaming tears emoji. Now they're back so you can be grinning face with sweat emoji. Order ahead on the McDonald's app. And get money mouth face emoji with two orders of crispy, irresistible 10-piece McNuggets, spicy or classic, for just $6. Limited time only. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Single item at regular price.